gentlemen. Thank you. And uh, well, while I put in my clicker, <clears throat> I've decided for no terribly good reason to embarrass my, my son who came with me tonight. This is, this is Tim Block. And he, he wrote the front end of this Java application, which says that our house is currently consuming 430 watts, which is actually pretty good. If, if any of you have tried to reduce the energy consumption in your house, you know that 430 watts is it's pretty hard to achieve. But yeah, we, we actually cut our electricity usage in half after writing this application. Um, the hardware that we're using is called TED, the energy detective from a company called Energy Inc. So check it out. But that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. Tonight, I have a feast of Java for you. At least I think I do. Let me see. And if we're real lucky, I'll even be able to use my clicker. All right. Um, so can everybody hear me, like, in the back? Yeah? Good. And my clicker even works. All right. So um, as promised, I'm going to start with some appetizers. Um, in fact, two kinds of appetizers. I will have visual things that don't do what they look like they do, and then I'll have code that doesn't do what it looks like it does. So let, let's start with the eye candy. So here we have the magic number from the Java class file format, Cafe Babe. And as you can see, the letters are tilted, right? So the C is kind of tilted this way, the A this way, the F this way, and so forth, right? Yeah. Right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to color the letters in with some light yellow ink. But I'm going to do it really gradually so you can see that I'm not moving them or anything, OK? Now, are they tilted? That's a trick. Well, let's remove the ink. There you go. Or what about this? I have some dots for you on a checkerboard. How many colors of dots do you see? Shout it out. Do you see? I'm not saying do you think are there. How many do you see? <laughs> three. Most people see three. They see light gray, mid gray, and dark gray. So what if I tell you they're all the same? And, and, and how do I prove it? I'm just going to dissolve away the checkerboard, leaving only the dots. All the same. Bring back the checkerboard, and they look different again. And now I'm going to tell you how it works. There are gradients in the squares. So like, if you look at this square, it goes from dark to light, dark to light, dark to light, and dark to light. It's surrounded by a dark to light gradient, so it looks dark. And what about these light ones? They're surrounded by light to dark gradients. And the mid-gray ones, they're along the diagonals where the colors of the squares don't change. So that's the actual color that you see. And now that you know how it works, of course, you don't see it anymore, right? They all look the same color. No, that's, <laughs> that's not the way your brain works. But luckily, with, with the code, once you know how the trick works, you, know, you can actually uh, avoid the problem in the future. So let's, let's do a, a couple of code puzzles. Um, how many people here have done puzzlers before? All right, for those of you who haven't done them before, here's how it works. I'm going to show you a small program that fits on a slide, and then I'm going to walk you through what it appears to do. And then you will tell me what it actually does by show of hands. It will be multiple choice, four choices. Um, and then, when you voted, I'll tell you what it really does. But it's not all fun and games. Each of these has a moral associated with it. Usually, it illustrates some sort of a coding trap. And by, by telling you what's going on, you can avoid that trap in the future. And this isn't like a you know, presidential primary. You do actually have to vote. Um, you know, I'm not going to go on until you vote. And in fact, we have, we have prizes. It's going to be a little bit tricky, because there are only three puzzles. But keep track of how many you got right on the honor system, and then I'll flip coins to see who gets the prizes. So without further ado, the first puzzle. This one is called Life's Persistent Questions. And in this case, the, the question is simply yes or no. So we have a static Boolean method here called yes or no that takes a string s and returns true or false depending on whether the, the string represents a yes answer or a no answer. So you might write this for you know, doing some sort of uh, command line application where the guy types in yes or no or true or false. And it tries to be kind of flexible. So what does it do? It takes its input string, first translates it to lowercase. So whatever case it starts in, now it's all lowercase. And then if the string equals yes or y or t, it replaces it with true. And finally, 
we call boolean.getBoolean to translate that string to a boolean, and we return that boolean. So my question to you is, what does this program print? And the program is very simple. It has only a main function, which calls println of yes or no on true, followed by a space, followed by yes or no on capital Y, lowercase e, capital S. So basically, we're parsing two strings with this method. And by the way, you're, you're allowed to talk amongst yourselves. You're not allowed to type it into Eclipse or anything like that. <laughs> and uh, then you'll tell me, does it return, or does it print, I should say, false, false? Does it print true, false, true, true, or none of the above? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Don't, don't yell it out. We'll, we'll take our votes in a moment. <laughs> and by the way, none of the above you know, could be I suppose it could be false true, it could be throws an exception, could be varies from run to run, you know, something like that. Could you say whether they all compile? Ah, yes. So in past, I've given some puzzlers that don't compile, and I found that the audience gets very, very angry. In fact, <laughs> people stopped throwing overripe fruit, and they started throwing underripe fruit, and it was beginning to hurt. So from now on, I promise, Space Cadet's honor, that all future puzzlers, including the three that I'm presenting this evening, will compile. Oh, I should say that some of them may, may call methods from java.util. They all begin with import java.util.star, but it's using my special white on white font, so you just can't see it. When you run it, is it just Java simple question? Yeah, when you run it, it's just Java simple question. In each case, you just, just up and run it, no command line arguments. All right, everybody, nobody's chattering and everybody's kind of nodding, so I guess you all got this one. So how many people say it's choice A, false, false? Uh, smattering, two, three, maybe four. And by the way, raise your hand up high so I can count you. <laughs> you know, have the courage of convictions. Well, I used to sing in choir when I was in college, and my choir director gave me very good advice. He basically said, if you're not sure you know the right note, sing loud. And, and to this day, I follow that advice. So. Sing loud. How many people for choice A? Five of you. How many people for choice B? True, false. One tentative. How many people for choice C? True, true. Half of you. So that means D must be approximately half of you, but raise your hands anyway. Yeah, actually D wins. All right, so what actually happens when you run this? As a practical matter, it prints false, false. And why does it print false, false? Well, the boolean.getBoolean method does not do what you think it does. Let's see what it actually does. See, here's what it says. It says, returns true if and only if the system property, <laughs> system property named by the argument exists and is equal to the string true. So unless you can prove to me that your laptop right now has a system property on it, you know, um, called whatever, yes, Whose, whose value is, in fact, true or something like that, the thing is just going to print false because there is no such named system property. It's a darn shame, isn't it? So let's take another look at it. Indeed, we are calling that horrid method. So how do you fix it? Well, you could fix it like this. Just call the method you meant to call. Boolean.parse boolean, you know, like integer.parseint. Mm -hmm. But I don't think this is actually a really good way to fix this program. And the reason is this. You're doing an awful lot of machinations just to make the string work for this method. Why use this method? This isn't really what you want at all. You know, and, and in fact, we're doing two lower case here, and then we're doing a case independent comparison in here. So we're kind of doing the work twice, and it's just you know, messier than it needs to be. So let's just do this. You know, if, if we simply go to lowercase and then compare it with all of the strings that we're interested in, then it clearly works. And that's what we're after. We, we, we want not something that merely works, but something that clearly works, right? OK, so the moral, strange and terrible methods lurk in the libraries. <laughs> there are some things that are in there that you don't know about and you're better off not knowing about. Um, I don't know why we didn't deprecate this one years ago. Um, so, so anyone who has the power to do that, you know, kind of open JDK committers out there, deprecate those methods. They're terrible. And by the way, there's one for every type, and, and they're in the types themselves, you know. So like, y there's integer.get integer, just like there's integer.parse integer. It's, it's just awful. Um, if your code misbehaves, 
then make sure you're calling the library methods you think you are. Read the documentation, click on it, you know, hover over it. You're, you're using these really nice development environments, so take advantage of them. And this is really about API designers. I should have bold-faced this line. Don't violate the principle of least astonishment. The principle of least astonishment says that every method should do the least astonishing thing given its name and its arguments. It should not astonish its callers. In this case, I think it probably astonished most of you. It certainly astonished me the first time I called it accidentally. Um, and don't violate the abstraction hierarchy, right? Good software is hierarchical. You write low level, well, try again. You write low level things on top of those higher level and so forth. So in this case, you have the class integer. That's like really low level. It's just a wrapper for an int. What's it doing calling out to properties? Properties is high level. So properties should depend on integer, not the other way around, or, or Boolean or whatever. Um, and by the way, properties is, is pretty well broken otherwise. Um, and, and finally, don't use similar names for wildly different behaviors. You got, you know, boolean.get boolean and boolean.parse boolean. And, and one of them, you know, merely looks at the string and does some local computations, and the other one goes out to system properties. That, that's not a wise API design decision. All right, I have one more puzzle before we, we get on to the, the main part of the main part of tonight's festivities. So this one is called Searching for the One. And aren't we all searching for the one? Anyway, so in this program, I'm sorry, I don't even know why I said that. Um, <laughs> in this program, we have an array of, of strings, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we translate the string array into a list of integers and then we use a binary search to search for the one. See, searching for the one, it's kind of a you know, pun, I guess, um, inside the, the list of integers. And we do it with a comparator. And here's the comparator. So let's go over the code in detail, shall we? Uh, so we got our main method. We have our string array, and it contains the strings 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then we have a list of integers, which we initialize to a new array list of integer empty. We iterate over all the strings, and notice we're using that cool for each. I like for each a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not biased in this matter, by the way. I just, <laughs> I just like it. Um, and then we add to integers integer.value of s. And notice I'm not doing the same thing to you twice. I actually used integer.value of, and I promise, once again, you know, space cadets honor, that um, this actually does translate these integers. So this becomes 0, this becomes 1, and, and so forth. Um, and, and then we store those integers into the list, you know, one at a time. So you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then finally, we print out the result of calling collections.binary search on this list for the integer 1. Um, and of course, we're autoboxing that up to the capital I integer 1 um, using our comparator here. And let's take a look at the comparator. Um, the comparator is, is quite straightforward. It takes its, its compare method, I should say, takes two integers. And as you probably know, the definition of a comparator is it should return a negative number, 0, or a positive number, as its first argument is less than, equal to, or greater than its second one. So let's look at the definition carefully. If the first argument is less than the second one, we return negative 1. Otherwise, if the first argument is equal to the second, we return 0. Otherwise, we know the first is greater than the second, so we return positive 1. Make sense? So my question to you, then, is what does this print? Oh, and, and I should tell you, just in case you don't know, the binary search method returns the index at which it finds the thing. So if it found 1 here, it would print out 5. I've conveniently you know, given each of these numbers, uh, I've made it into an identity array, let's say. Um, and if it does not find it, it returns, mm, roughly speaking, negative the position at which you would put it. Actually, rather than negative, it's the bitwise complement, simply because negative 0 is 0. And so, you know, if it's at position zero that it would go, it actually returns integer.min value for what it's worth. No, that's a lie. If it's at position zero, it returns negative one, because the bitwise complement of zero is negative one. Anyway, so um, take a look at it, and then, and then we'll, we'll go through your choices, which are zero, one, minus two, and none of the above. We have a moment. All right, it's time to vote. So how many people say choice A? that this will return and, and then print out 0. How many people for choice A? That's my answer, and I'm going to stick with it. So we have like three, including me. 
OE of little faith. Um, how many people say choice B, uh, position one? Uh, that looks like a quarter of you for choice B. Um, how many people say choice C, negative two? Mm, a scant quarter of you for negative two. And how many people say choice D, none of the above? Uh, most of you. All right, so, so I'm going to say choice D wins then. Um, and in fact, it turns out that as a practical matter, this program will print negative two. If you run this on any implementation of Java that I know, it'll print negative two. Um, but in theory, it's unspecified. And the reason for that is the comparator is broken. It violates its contract. And once you have an object that violates its contract, then all bets are off. So it turns out that it's, I mean, it's really an implementation detail that it prints out negative two, and it could print out something else. But let, let's take a look. Oh, and autoboxing is tricky, by the way. This program used autoboxing, and autoboxing can give you what we call the surprise left jab, and it does so here. Um, so let's take a look at this. It, it seems obvious that this ought to work, right? I mean, how much clearer could this be? If i is less than j, return negative one. If i is equal to j, return zero. Otherwise, return positive one. What could possibly go wrong? Well, yes, I, I hear it from the front row. The answer is identity. The problem is i and j are object references, and we could not change for upward compatibility. We couldn't change the behavior of the double equals operator on um, object references, and it returns true if and only if two object references are identical. Being equal isn't good enough, and in this case, we know by the specification of the libraries that these two zeros, the, the one that we pass in, sorry, the two ones, the one that we pass in and the one that we get by calling um, integer.value of are actually different instances of the integer one. It turns out this is very strange, but the specification of the method actually guarantees that, oh, sorry, um, the specification of the method guarantees that if you call this integer.value of method, it will not cache and reuse results. You're getting fresh, newly made integers. The Lord knows why, but the spec says so. Um, so that's what's wrong with it. And, and how do we fix it? Well, you could fix it in either of these two ways, right? What doesn't work is double equals. So if we do the tests in the opposite order, we say if it's i less than j, negative 1, i greater than j, uh, positive 1, otherwise 0. Does that work? Yes because both of these tests, these, these comparative operators, actually do auto-unboxing, so they work properly. Alternatively, we could replace the double equals with a dot equals, which, which forces a value comparison. But I don't like either of these solutions. And the reason I don't like them is they kind of dance around the problem. It's like they work, but they're very delicate code. And somebody can take a look at that and say, oh, why is he doing this check in the strange order and switch the order, and then it would break. Or someone could look at this and say, well, gee, you know, why isn't he just using auto-unboxing all the time? It seems inconsistent that he's using it twice on the line, but you know, here's making an explicit call to dot equals. So I think that the best solution is this. Manually unbox those suckers and add a comment saying why you're doing it. Unbox the arguments to force value comparison, perhaps even instead of identity comparison if the slide was a little bit bigger. So that's, that's my preferred solution. And what can we learn from this one? First of all, and you know, the funny thing is I've been saying this for like five years, ever since we did autoboxing. Autoboxing blurs, but does not erase the distinction between integers and ints, between boxed primitives and primitives. They're different. And the main way in which they're different, the main ways, are identity and nullness. So the boxed ones can be null, and the boxed ones have identity distinct from equality, whereas um, the, the primitives are pure value types. And then also know that only four of the six comparison operators actually work on boxed primitives. Less than, greater than, less equal, and greater than equal work. All the ones that actually have a less than or greater than sign works. But double equals and unequals do not work on boxed primitives. It is, it is very, very hard to test for this, by the way. You know, suppose you sorted a list using this thing. Would it work? Almost certainly yes. You know, I, I can come up with, you know, strange inputs which would prevent it from working. But 99% of the time it would work. So there are plenty of comparators out there that are this broken. And you know, you'll never discover that they're broken until you're, I don't know, demonstrating it to your most important customer when the president and the vice president are 
present at the mahogany table. Um, also, another interesting lesson here is even Josh and Neil Gafter make big mistakes. So it turns out that that broken one, if you have a copy of the first printing of this fine book, you'll see it listed as the, you know, in the solutions section with an even more broken comparator to, we fix it using this obviously correct comparator. So Neil and I put the broken comparator into the book. Pretty bad, huh? Anyway, on to, oh, yeah, I already did this. On, on to the main course. Um, so the main course is a, a, a talk all about effective Java. And what I've done tonight is um, I have sort of a few, a few interesting topics from the second edition of Effective Java, um, which uh, I'm presenting. The book has a lot of stuff in it. In addition to everything that was in the first edition, um, it has a whole chapter on generics, a whole chapter on enums and annotations, and one or more items on each of the other language constructs that was added in Java 5. Um, the threads chapter was renamed concurrency uh, in honor of the fact that we now have java.util.concurrent and that you really shouldn't be thinking in terms of threads anymore. Threads are mere implementation detail for implementing concurrency. You should be thinking in terms of concurrency, and whenever possible, you should be using higher level concurrency abstractions of the sort provided by java.util.concurrent. Um, all existing items have been updated to reflect current best practices. So I, I basically went through every word of the book, and a few items were added in honor of new patterns, some of which I will tell you about tonight, and a, a very few were deleted because they no longer seemed relevant. So anyway, that's, that's the book, and of course I can't discuss all this tonight. The book is you know, 278 pages long. The first had 57 items and the second had 78, which is kind of too bad. I always wanted to write a slim volume, and I don't think I can claim it's a slim volume anymore, but it's as slim as the language will let it be, I suppose. So, um, what, what's on the agenda for dinner then? Um, first I'm going to talk about generics, and this is by far the longest section of the talk. Um, then very short sections on enums, var args, and concurrency, and finally a slightly longer section on, on a good way to do serialization that should be better known, but, but isn't. So, on with generics. And the, the first thing I'm going to tell you is, is you know, perhaps the most important thing that uh, I'm going to talk about tonight. If you come away learning only item 28, then, you know, um, the talk has been worth your while. So, you probably know that Java has what are called wildcards to allow you to write APIs that are flexible. Why do you need them? Well, arrays in Java are covariant. So if I have an array of object type parameter and an array of strings, can I pass the array of strings in? Yes, I can. Array of strings is a subtype of array of object. But suppose I have list of object as a parameter type and I want to pass in a list of strings. Can I do that? No, I can't. because Collection types and generic types in general are invariant. And, you know, th there's one good thing about this, which is it gives you better compile time type safety. Suppose that I have this thing whose uh, parameter, whose type is array of object. I pass in an array of string, and then inside the function, I store an integer into it. What happens? Runtime error. Does anyone know what runtime error? Very close. Class cast exception, it's called array store exception. No, it's array store exception, I swear. Um, if it's VM error, you've got a bad VM, and I can tell you where you can get a better one. But <laughs> that said, um, you know, basically, the, the arrays give you more flexibility, but worse compile time type safety. Generics give you great compile time type safety, but Unless you use those wildcard types, they don't give you the flexibility. So the wildcard types give you back the flexibility. They let you combine the, the, the flexibility with the compile time type safety. But they're a little bit tricky to use. List of string is a subtype of list of question mark extends object, whereas list of object is a subtype of list of question mark super string. Pretty hard to remember, right? So I have for you a very simple mnemonic. And if you just learn this simple mnemonic, then you'll never have to worry about it. Again, just use the mnemonic. Here's the mnemonic with a helpful visual aid. <laughs> the mnemonic is PEX. It's short for Producer Extends Consumer Super. By the way, I trust you all recognize this man? <laughs> yeah, back then, I think he, you know, he took steroids or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's, that is our governor, but when he was younger and buffer. Uh, 
So, so what does this mean? Producer extends, consumer super. It means when I'm passing in a parameter from which I want to produce t's, I want to get t's from this thing, then I should use the type foo question mark extends t, producer extends. Whereas if I'm passing in a parameter into which I want to put t's, that is the thing consumes elements of type t, then I want to use question mark super t. Producer extends, consumer super. And this only applies to input parameters. Don't try and use it on return types. I'll tell you why in a, in a few slides. But first, let's try it out. Let's, let's flex our pecs, shall we? So suppose I have an API that looks like this. I have a stack that has the usual stack methods, push and pop, and I want to add bulk methods. Push all, which takes a collection of elements um, of type E, and then puts all of those elements, pushes them onto the stack. If I have stack of E, and I declare the method like this, with collection of E, now suppose I have a stack of objects, and I want to push into it all the elements from a collection of strings. Should I be able to do that? Sure, they're all objects. But will it combine, compile? No, it won't, because the E's don't match. You know, I've got a collection of strings, and I'm trying to put it into a collection of a uh, stack of, of objects. The E's don't match. Invariant typing, you lose. So let's repeat our silly mnemonic. PEX, producer extends consumer super. So the question is, this source, this suggestively named source parameter, which is a source of objects of type E, is it producing objects of type E, or is it consuming objects of type E? It's producing objects of type E. So our, our mnemonic tells us producer extends. So we should replace collection of E with collection of question mark extends E. Simple as that. Now let's look at the pop all method. And that's sort of the opposite, right? In this case, you know, we have a method called pop all, which takes a collection and takes all the elements from the stack and pops them into our collection, the suggestively named destination parameter, because we're putting things into it. Is it a producer of E's or is it consuming them? It's consuming them. So PEX, producer extends, consumer super. So we want to use question mark super E, collection of question mark super E. And once we do that, what do we gain? Well, here's what we gain. Now, um, if you have someone who has a stack of number, not only can they call push all with collection of number with the exact match, but they can call push all with a collection of longs, longs extend number, or any other type that extends number. So you get back all the flexibility that you had with arrays and, and more. You also get compile time type safety. Um, and what about pop all? Well, pop all, you know, if you have a stack of number with the old definition, all you could do was pop it into a collection of numbers. Whereas now we can pop all from our stack of number into a collection of objects, just as we should, because every number is an object. So that's basically all there is to it. If you remember that mnemonic, PEX, you'll, you'll never be confused again about when to use extends or super. Oh, and here's, here's another little example of it. Um, this one's maybe a bit trickier. So we have a, a generic method. You all know what generic methods are? They're, they're methods that have type parameters for the method rather than for the type. Um, so we have something called set. Um, sorry, the method's called union, and it takes two sets, set S1 and set S2, and it returns the set that is their union. So right now, all these things are E, they all have to match. So you take a set of strings and another set of strings, you get back a set of strings. That's great. But what if you have a set of integers and a set of floats, and you want to get back a set of numbers? Will this definition work? No, it won't, because these generic types are invariant. So how do you make it work? Flex your pecs. So um, S1 here, are we using it as a source of elements of type E? That is, is it producing them, or is it consuming them? Producing. producing. And what about S2? Also producing. So in both cases, we should use question mark extends E. And what about the return type? Doesn't matter. Don't use the mnemonic for the return type. Always use the exact type for the return type. And I will tell you why in a couple slides. I keep saying that, but I really will. All right, so how should the definition look? Declaration like this, set of question mark extends E, S1, set of question mark extends E, 
S2 because both S1 and S2 are E producers. Now, why no wildcard type for the return value? Here's why. Why do we use wildcards? We use them for one reason, which is to make our APIs more flexible. The API should just work. People who do the right thing, who don't try to pass in something that's going to blow up, it should just work. They shouldn't have to think about it. The clients of an API, the users of a library, should not have to think about wildcards. What happens if you return a wildcard type? You need like variables of the wildcard type in order to store the, the return values. And does it actually give you any more flexibility? No, it really doesn't make your API any more flexible. It just makes it more difficult to use. Um, so, so based on this principle that wildcard should sort of vanish before the API user's eyes, um, you should never return a wildcard type. So that, that about settles it, right? Well, no. A little bit of truth in advertising. Suppose we declare it this way, and we actually try to use it to do just what I said. That is, we have a set of integers, a set of doubles, and we take their union and try to store it into a set of numbers. Sometimes it doesn't always just work. The compiler gives you this incomprehensible error message. It says, found set of number and comparable question mark extends number and comparable question mark required set of numbers. So what's really going on here? What's really going on is whenever you call one of these generic methods, the compiler is doing what's called type inference. It's figuring out a type that works for E based on your arguments. And in this case, it figured out the wrong type. You just found a limitation in the type inference algorithm that the Java compiler uses and that the Java language specifies. So what can you do when the compiler does not infer the correct type? Tell the comp compiler the correct type. It's called explicit type parameters. So you use this hideously ugly union dot open angle bracket number close angle bracket union of ints doubles. It is, it is hideous. It turns out actually that God kills a kitten every time you specify an explicit type parameter. Um, and, and luckily, you know, we are doing some things um, in Project Coin and in, in future Java language development to reduce the number of times you'll have to use these explicit type parameters. Um, I think they're incredibly painful, and I hope you never have to use any, but occasionally you will. So if you get a nasty error message like this, just say, darn compiler, darn language, and specify the thing explicitly, and try not to think about the kitten. Well, well, how did it go wrong? What did it infer? You, you know what? Mean? I'm actually going to take this one offline, because it's a long talk as it stands. I will tell you one thing, which is the type inference algorithm takes up like 23 pages in the Java language specification. So that's the, the short answer. You know, basically, it's a difficult question. It's actually impossible to do type inference for complicated enough languages. And all you Scala programmers out there know that Scala has you know, a much more complex type inference engine than Java's, which can do a lot more. But even it gives up occasionally. It, it, can't, it can't infer every type you want it to. All right, so here's a summary of our mnemonic in tabular form. Producer extends consumer super. That is, if the parameter is going to be used to produce t instances, then you use foo of question mark extends t. If the parameter is going to consume t instances, use foo of question mark super t. And if you're the academic type, this is called covariant in t, question mark extends t. And this is called contravariant in t, question mark super t. But I think this table raises a question, right? I've only filled in two of the four blanks. What happens if I have a parameter that I want to both produce and consume t instances? I want to put t's into the collection and take t's out of the collection. Then what do I do? Or what about? Suppose I want to neither produce nor consume. You might say, well, why are you even passing in the parameter if you don't want to produce or consume? But it turns out that there are plenty of useful methods that neither produce nor consume. Suppose I write a method that applies a filter function and removes everything for which the filter function returns false. You know, it's not actually putting any t's in there, nor is it taking any t's out. It's simply removing elements without looking at them, right? So that is neither producing nor consuming. Or suppose I have uh, a method that um, reverses the order of a collection. You know, yeah, I guess you could say it's producing and consuming, but it's only producing and consuming from itself. So you know, it. it um, what, what, what types do you use for these? Well, here are the types you use. Um, if it is both producing and consuming, you use simply foo of t. Don't use wildcards. The intersection of the types foo of question mark extends t, and foo of question mark super t is foo of t. So if it's, if it's both a producer and consumer, 
true of t, and that's called invariant in t, as I said before. Um, if it's neither producing nor consuming, then you use foo of question mark. And that just means foo of any type. Since I'm not producing or consuming, so I don't really care what type is in there, I can pass in foo of anything. And by the way, note well, foo of question mark is not the same as foo. Foo without the question mark is a raw type and is unsafe. If you use it, the compiler can no longer sort of reason about your program and cannot assure you of the type safety of the program. So if you want to tell the compiler, the guy can pass in uh, foo of any type. You should say, you must say foo of question mark. All right, so that's, that's the longest part of the talk. So congratulations on slogging through that one. Um, and, and I hope you all uh, sort of remember to flex your pecs. It really will make your life as a programmer easier. Uh, one more on generics. And this, this is a pattern that I just love. It's how to write a container with an arbitrary number of type parameters. So most of the containers or collections in Java have a fixed number of type parameters, right? You got your collection. It has one type parameter, the element type, E. You got your map. It has two type parameters, the key type and the value type. That's usually great, but sometimes it's not enough. What if you're trying to write a, uh, a database row, right? It's got a whole bunch of columns. How many? Who knows? It differs from row to row. And they all have their own types. Suppose you want this all to be type safe. Is it possible? You know, I didn't used to think it was possible, but it is possible. Um, and here's how you do it. You use a new, uh, a new pattern called the type safe heterogeneous container pattern, or THC for short. It's, it's a mind expanding pattern. <laughs> and I, I will tell you all about it. So the basic idea is very, very simple. You don't parameterize the collection. You don't have like collection of E. Instead, you parameterize the selector. And what is the selector? The selector is something that you present to the collection in order to withdraw an element from the collection. And the data is strongly typed at compile time, and you can have unlimited type parameters for the same collection, because you can have as many selectors as you like. So in our, our database row example, the row itself is not parameterized, but each column is. And you have you know, one column whose type parameter is string, because that column contains a string, one that the, the thing is you know, big decimal, and, and so forth. Um, so let's go into a little more detail. Um, suppose that I want to implement a favorite database. And what is a favorites database? Quite simply, it's a little database whose keys are class objects and whose values are elements of that class. Okay? So it can store your favorite string, your favorite integer, your favorite float, your favorite class, you know, whatever. Um, and you see how that has arbitrarily many type parameters, one for each favorite you're storing. So let's look at the API first. Um, we have the class favorites. It has two parameterized methods. Notice that the methods are parameterized, not the type. Um, and what you do to put an element into our favorites database is you pass the class object, which is its selector, and you pass the instance. And notice how we're type checking it. It's a class of t and a t instance. So that will not even compile if I tell it my favorite string is 43, because 43 isn't a string. You know? So at compile time, and by the way, you don't have to, I see some of you guys taking notes, or maybe you're writing email to your girlfriend, but if you're taking notes, don't bother. All this stuff is online. If you type type safe heterogeneous container um, into Google, it's on Google already, this whole talk. And also, it's in this fine book, um, at least one copy of which I'll be giving away at the end of the evening. Yeah? Well, yeah, uh, I, maybe I shouldn't use integer and string as my, my example. But you know, the, the point is that um, as, as long as, you know, as long as the types match, it compiles. If they don't match, it won't compile. Um, and then how does the get method work? It takes the class object, the selector, and it returns an instance of that class. And how does it look when you use it? Here's a little client program. It's really, really straightforward. I create a favorites, which is a collection that holds multiple different types. That's where the heterogeneous in type safe heterogeneous container comes from. And it's type safe. So I put into it my favorite string, which as you all know is Java, my favorite integer, which is the hexadecimal number cafe babe, and my favorite class, which I guess is thread local tonight. It could be anything. Um, and then if I get my favorite string out, um, 
it's returned in a variable of type string. And that would not compile if I put, say, integer here. Why wouldn't it compile? Because you know, the, the, the types have to match, and they wouldn't match. Um, my favorite integer gets stored in an int. There I'm doing some auto unboxing. Um, and my favorite class gets stored in a class object. And by the way, there's our, our question mark, class of question mark. Uh, it turns out that um, that's kind of the best you can do. Uh, and then if I print them out, it'll, it'll print out you know, whatever they are, the, the string, the integer, and the class, Java Cafe Babe, and Thread Local. Great. And the implementation of this thing must be really complicated, right, because of what it's doing. No, this is the whole implementation. This runs. So let's read it very carefully. Um, first of all, inside each favorites object, we have a map. Um, and I think I'm using a hash map. And what does it map? It maps a class of some type to an object. Now, is that strong enough to enforce our guarantee that we only map the string class to a string object, the integer class to an integer object, and so forth? Not at all. There's no, you know, because of the fact that you can't do it based on the ordinary collections that only have a fixed number of type parameters. So basically, this maps an arbitrary class object to an arbitrary object. But we're only going to use it in this restrictive way. We are not going to put in mappings that don't uh, meet our, our criterion. Okay? And now let's look at the put favorite method. As we said, it takes uh, two parameters of type class of t and t. If the type is null, it throws a null pointer exception because that's not a legitimate type value. And the point is, we're only storing it into the collection, right? So if we simply tried to store it with null, would it work? Yes. And would it blow up later? You always want to blow up as soon as possible. And, and so the, the lesson there is uh, always validate your arguments. That's what I'm doing. And then we put into the map a mapping from type to instance. Do we know that instance is, in fact, an instance of the type? Yes, we do. And now we get it out. We get it out, we pass in the type object, we look it up in favorites. And what does this return? What is the type of favorites.getType? What is the type of the underlined expression? Object. Darn shame. We're not supposed to return an object. We're supposed to return a T. So how do we turn it into a T? Well, we have a class object of type class of T lying around. And it turns out that class, as of Java 5, has a new method called cast, class.cast, which is the dynamic equivalent of the cast operator in Java. So if you have a class object and you call class.cast on an object reference, what does it do? It checks if the reference is in fact an instance of that class. If it is, it simply returns it unchanged. If it isn't, it throws a class cast exception. Right? So it's doing exactly what the cast operator does, but it's doing it dynamically based on a class object rather than you know, statically based on uh, the actual class that you've textually included in the program. And that's all there is to it. That works. That's the type safe heterogeneous um, container pattern. And you can use that to do databases and things like that that are, that are type safe and actually work. So I commend it to all of you. All right. Now on to a bunch of easy sections. You've, you've made it through almost all the hard stuff. Truth in advertising, once again, compels me to tell you that that last section on serialization is a little bit tricky. So how are you all doing? Are you, you basically um, keeping up with the material? Excellent. Good. So enum types. This one's really easy. So prefer two element enums to booleans. It seems obvious, but you know I see people doing the opposite. So this is consider this one a reminder. Which would you rather see in code? Double temp equals thermometer dot get temp of true, or double temp equals thermometer dot get temp of temperature scale dot Fahrenheit. This one tells me what kind of temperature I'm getting back. This one doesn't tell me much at all. You know, yeah, maybe your IDE, if you're lucky, when you hover over the thing, will tell you. But you know, what if you print it out, or what if your friend's IDE isn't as good as yours, or whatever. Um, and and some people say, oh, but Josh, you know, this is just way too long compared to true. And I say, oh, you know. If you must, use static import, and then you can just say Fahrenheit. Um, but I, I far prefer this. And this, I think, would be reason enough to use these two element enums. But it turns out there's an even better reason. And that reason is they evolve. So for example, you know, suppose you start out with a temperature scale that includes Fahrenheit and Celsius. And then you know, some science nerd wants Kelvin. No problem. Just add a third one. If he'd used a Boolean, you're stuck. There is no third value, right? And, and then suppose you realize that, my gosh, I have all these different temperature scales. I'd like to be able to convert them to some common temperature. No sweat. Add a method 
to the enum. You can do that in Java, called two Celsius, that you know, no matter what temperature scale you have, will convert uh, uh, you know, a temperature value of the scale represented by the constant into a Celsius temperature. So that's why you should always use, almost always, use two element enums rather than true or false. Uh, see, I told you this part of the talk was easy. Um, now, var args. I have a, a little useful pattern and a half for you to use with var args. So here's the simplest case of var args. This, this slide is basically just to remind you all about what var args are, what they do. So var args allows you to pass uh, a bunch of arguments of indeterminate length and do something reasonable with them. So in this case, we have a method that takes a bunch of ints and returns their sum, right? Static int sum, and the type of the argument is int dot dot dot, and that means zero or more integers, and it kind of boxes them up into an array for you. So how do we do it? We simply set the sum, that is the return value, to zero. We iterate using the for each loop over all the integers that were passed in. In turn, we add each one into sum, and finally we return the sum. So does that, that make sense to all of you? Great. Now, suppose you want to write a var args method that takes one or more arguments instead of zero or more. Why would you want to do something like that? Yeah, suppose you're writing a min function. Min isn't defined if you pass in only zero arguments. So in code reviews, I've seen an awful lot of code that looks like this. If args.length equals zero, throw new illegal argument exception. Too few arguments. Otherwise, we'll set min to the first argument then we'll iterate over all the other arguments, and if an argument is smaller than our um, uh, tentative minimum, we assign it to the tentative minimum, and finally, having gone over all of the elements in the array, we know we've found the true minimum, and we return it. Does this work? Yeah, this works, but you can do better. What's wrong with it? The, the biggest thing that's wrong with it is it fails at runtime if it's invoked with no arguments. Things should always fail as soon as possible. Wouldn't you rather have something that failed at compile time? I would. Um, it's ugly. This explicit validity check, it's just nasty looking. And finally, it interacts poorly with the for each loop. See, because we're, we're going from the you know, second element, that is the element sub one, to the end rather than the, the zero. So I didn't bother using the for each loop. So what do we do? It turns out there's a really easy solution and really pretty too. I think it's pretty. Just declare it like this, int first arg, int dot 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 remaining args, okay? Now, you cannot compile this with no args. It only compiles if you have at least one, and then you can use your for each again, right? For each int in the remaining args. If it's less than the minimum, it becomes the new tentative minimum. Finally, return it. And notice, no validity check anymore. I don't need it because it can't fail at runtime. It fails at compile time. So that's the right way to require one or more arguments. Um, sorry, ho hold the question only because the talk is as long as it is. Normally, I like to take questions during the talk, but I just, I'm worried that I'm going to keep you guys here too late. Um, all right. So, um, and here's a, a variant on that. Um, and by the way, this is an optimization. This should only be used where performance is critical. If you do this and you haven't proven to yourself that performance in this case is critical, then you are doing premature optimization, which is the root of all evil. So don't do it. But if you have a case where the problem with var args is var args automatically creates an array and, and, and kind of puts everything into an array, but it costs time and garbage collector pressure to create all these arrays, and sometimes you really can't afford that. In that case, what you do <clears throat> is instead of having only one thing, you know, to take the case with one argument, you have one, two, three, four, five, and finally, if more than five, default to the version with var args. Because the way the, the method overload resolution works, if you can resolve a method without resorting to var args, you do, right? So in this case, as long as you have five or fewer arguments, you'll end up using one of these methods. And by the way, these actually are the static factories for enum sets. So if I say enum set of uh, typeface italic, comma, typeface bold, it does no array allocations because we wanted enum set to be fast as a bat out of hell, and it pretty much is. Um, and and the, the other interesting point is that, you know, basically the number of methods is a function of the way in which you expect the API to be used. So if you can sort of look at a corpus of code and say, ah, yes, 95% of the calls have five or fewer arguments, uh, then, you know, five is probably the magic number for you. 
So just, just look at the code and try to figure out how many methods you need. Um, all right, so that's all I have to say about var args. And now a concurrency item. Usually concurrency stuff is hard. This one's actually pretty easy. Um, and it's about common abuses of concurrent hash map. Concurrent hash map is a great class. Why is it great? You know, it combines high concurrency, that is lots of things can happen in parallel, with high speed. And how does it do that? It does it because Doug Lee is very clever. He's very clever, and he wrote it very carefully, and he spent a long time writing it. And it uses fancy things inside, like lock striping and non-blocking algorithms. And the whole idea behind concurrency utilities is that you and I don't have to know about all this stuff because Doug knows about it. You know, it, it allows us to basically multiplex Doug's knowledge. Um, and in fact, it, it pretty much makes the old style synchronized collections obsolete. So you used to say, collections.synchronized map of new hash map. Don't do that anymore. Just use java.util.concurrent.concurrent um, hash map. In fact, import all that crap so you don't actually have to you know, say the package name. But anyway, that's what you should use. But use it right. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, never synchronize on a concurrent collection. You know, whether it's a concurrent hash map or a concurrent link queue or any of those fancy Doug collections. Don't synchronize on them. They do their synchronization internally, and you synchronizing on it will have no effect on other ongoing operations on the thing. Because, you know, the operations on the thing, like if you synchronize on a hash table, does that mean someone else cannot do a concurrent put? Yes, it does. You've, you've blocked that thing cold. But there's a funny thing about synchronization. You know, some people think, oh yeah, synchronization is like concurrency. Uh-uh. Synchronization is the opposite of concurrency. Concurrency is lots of things happening in parallel. Synchronization is me blocking you to a first approximation. That's a little bit cutesy and, and not completely correct, but it's still you know, worth, worth remembering. So the point is that if I synchronize on a concurrent collection, other things can still happen because the other methods that Doug wrote aren't looking at the lock on that collection at all. They simply don't use it. So <clears throat> here's a arguably broken method that's trying to do string in turning. Um, and, and by string in turning, what I mean is we have a map from a string to a string, and what it does is the first time it sees each string value, it stores that string value in the map, and the second and successive times it returns the string value. That's exactly what string.intern does for you, but here's an implementation of it. So um, how does this implementation try to work? It synchronizes on the map, gets something out of it. If it's null, it puts the thing into it and sets the results that will be returned to the parameter that was passed in, and it returns that. But it's no good. It's synchronizing on the map. Don't do that. So what should you do? Well, you know, the problem is that we're trying to atomically combine two things, right? Checking for the presence of this string in the map and putting something in if it wasn't already there. And how can you do that on a concurrent collection? You can't. You cannot atomically combine stuff. And so what they've done is they've done a whole bunch of atomic combinations for you, these little mini transactions that have names like put if absent. So here is a correct but suboptimal version of this interning utility. It says string previous value equals map put if absent s comma s. And that means if there's no mapping from s at all, put a mapping from s to itself. Otherwise, leave it alone and return whatever the previous value used to be. If the previous value was null, indicating that there was no entry for that string, then we have just put in the first entry for it. So we have done the, the actual interning, and we should return our argument. Otherwise, we should return the previous value. Make sense? And what's wrong with it? The only thing wrong with it is that it calls put if absent every time it reads a value, not only the first time. And it turns out that put if absent is much more expensive and, and more damning. It's not just expensive, but it um, causes contention. It turns out that when you're doing a get from a concurrent hash map, it causes no contention whatsoever. Any operation, you know, read or write, can go on in parallel with a get. It's like magic. Um, but so this is not the best way to do it. What is the best way to do it? This is the best way to do it. It's, it's kind of like the double check idiom, except it works. Um, actually, the double check idiom works too, if done with volatiles. So I'm just being cutesy tonight, I guess. But um, you say string result equals map.get of s from our concurrent hash map. So if it gets something, we're done. Just return it. But suppose it doesn't get anything. Then we call put if absent ss. Almost always, result will be null. But if there was a race condition, if two people were calling this at the same time and someone else got their value in first, 
then result will be something other than null, and we should return that result. Does that make sense? So that is the correct way to do it. And it turns out, by the way, that on my machine, which I have at home, I, I measured, this one is 250% faster than the other one, besides you know, being much better from a contention perspective. And one more solution that doesn't work at all. This, this code is very badly broken. So why, why am I showing you broken code? Because we found that 15% of all uses of put if absent don't look at their return value. It's almost always wrong to call put if absent and not look at the return value. So here's what you don't do. Put if absent s comma s and then return s. You're returning the argument. You're always returning the argument, even if it was already present in the map. So this is like doubly wrong. It's both expensive and it doesn't actually work as an interner. So don't do this. If you're calling put if absent, you should almost certainly be looking at the return value. So summary, the old style synchronized collections are pretty well obsolete. Instead, use concurrent hash map and friends, but never synchronize on the entire thing. They don't work that way. Instead, use put if absent and friends and use them properly. Only use them after you've done a read first, because the reads are so much cheaper, and always check the return value. All right, now I have one last section on serialization, and then a little tiny dessert course, but it's really short. Um, it's a puzzle. So serialization is fraught with peril. Anyone who's read you know, the first edition of Effective Job or who's ever heard me talk about the topic knows that I feel that serialization is a dangerous thing. What's wrong with it? Many things. First of all, it causes implementation details to leak into public APIs. This is really bad, right? If I just say implement serializable, all of a sudden, all of my private fields become part of the serial persistent representation of this object. They're private fields and they're part of a public API, which is my serial persistent representation. Can I ever change them? Well, yes, but it becomes incredibly painful. If you want to see examples of, of you know, code like this, look in uh, the JDK for things that were sort of made serializable before people really thought about what it meant. Look at big integer where I was the one who goofed. So. Um, that's, that's one example of what happens. Uh, another bad thing is it's too magical. Instances are created without ever invoking a constructor. When you deserialize an object, you call read object, you get a new object of you know, some type, let's say a new, you know, I don't know what, um, um, Fruby. It didn't call any of the Fruby constructors, none of them. It's like magic, and that's very bad because when you're writing uh, an object, what you tend to do is you have some invariance, right? You make sure that all of your constructors establish the invariance and all of your methods maintain the invariance. And you're done, right? That guarantees that all your invariance will be true for all time, right? Yes, unless you say implement serializable, in which case you have this other sort of magical pseudo constructor, which is read object, and that can produce instances of your class that violate their invariance, and that can be very dangerous. Um, it doesn't combine well with final fields. So it turns out, that um, if when you deserialize something, it's impossible to get the correct value into some final field because let's say it's something with a kind of a runtime present, like a, a thread or something, uh, what can you do? You know, you have two choices. Either make it non-final or use reflection to change the value of a final field. Neither of these things are pleasant. You're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, so, so what are the results of all these things together? If you use serialization, you will suffer from increased maintenance costs, increased likelihood of bugs, and increased security problems. It's just a fact of life, pretty much. But it turns out there is a better way. You can avoid these problems. And you can do it using what I call the serialization proxy pattern. The basic idea is really unbelievably simple. Simply don't serialize instances of your class. Instead, serialize instances of a idealized representation of the state of your class. Make a little nested static class that does nothing but hold the state in its sort of most concise form, and then reconstitute these little state mementos into actual instances of your class at deserialization time using only the public APIs. And that's the magic. You're using only the public APIs, right? No longer are we having deserialization auto-magically give us an instance of our class? We're calling a public static factory or a, or a public uh, constructor to get the instance. So let's look at it in a little bit more detail. The first step is to design the serialization proxy. It's a struct-like proxy class that 
concisely represents the logical state of a class to be serialized, then declare it as a static nested class of the class that you're going to be serializing, and then provide a single constructor for the proxy, which takes as its argument a single instance of the enclosing class, in essence turning an instance of the class into its proxy. And there's no need for consistency checks or defensive copies here. No need at all. It's OK if somebody serializes a broken instance of the serialization proxy. Why? Well, because the uh, contents of it are just going to be used in calls to public methods. And those public methods are going to do the validity checks. So what do you do? You put a write replace method on the enclosing class. And literally, it is this code. You can, you can cut and paste this into every class that you want to do a serialization proxy for. The write replace method simply returns new serialization proxy of this, so that translates the object into its serialization proxy. Then you put a read resolve method on the proxy. Do you guys know about write replace and read resolve, by the way? By show of hands, who here knows write replace and read resolve? Okay, write replace and read resolve allow you to intercede method calls onto the serialization chain such that. Um, the way write replace works is when something is being serialized, before you return the serialized stream, you pass the object that's about to be serialized to a write replace method. And instead of serializing the object itself, you serialize whatever is returned by write replace. So in this place, in this case, what does write replace do? It says, hey, don't serialize the object. Instead, serialize a new serialization proxy representing the object. Read resolve is kind of the the opposite operation, which is used not when you're serializing, but when you're deserializing. And it says, you know, after you've deserialized an instance of something, instead of returning it directly, call the read resolve method on it and return whatever the read resolve method returns. So in this case, you put a read resolve method on the serialization proxy that calls public API methods of the enclosing class to create a new instance that represents that proxy. And that's it. So how does it look in practice? Once again, you might think, oh, there's got to be a trick. It's really complicated. No, it turns out that there isn't. And here's how I'm going to prove it. This is a real life example. This is actually a set serialization proxy. I, I came up with this pattern for a set. It turns out that it's particularly useful for a set for a reason I'll tell you in a moment. But let's look at it first, just so I can show you that I have nothing up my sleeve, as it were. Um, so what does the serialization proxy have? What is the idealized representation of an set? Well, it's a type the enumerated type, and a bunch of elements of the type. So we have a private final class instance being the element type, and then an array of enums being the elements themselves. Why do I need the type? Well, what if the, what if the set is empty? If the set is empty, I don't have any elements of the type, so I don't know the type. It's the only way to know the type and, and uh, thus offer you know, runtime type safety. Uh, for the enum set, not just runtime type safety, but it turns out you need to know the type in order to perform the various operations on an enum set. It's just critical. So um, this is the idealized representation. That is, this is the serialization proxy. And remember, we said it has one constructor that takes an element of the set, sorry, of, of, of the enclosing class, which in this case is enum set, and returns its serialization proxy. And what does it do? It simply copies the type from the enum set into its element type field and then calls the two array method on the enum set to get all of the contents of the thing into elements. And notice, by the way, that this both uses public methods like two array as well as looking at internal fields. It's all right if the serialization proxy constructor uses the internals of the enclosing class, but it's not all right if the read resolve method uses anything private. The whole idea behind this pattern is that the read resolve method, which translates instances of the serialization proxy into um, instances of the enclosing class. That one has to use only public APIs. So let's take a look. How does it work? Well, first, we call enumset.none of the element type. So that's the standard um, static factory to create an enum set consisting of no elements of a given type. And then we iterate over all the elements in the elements array, and we add each one to the enum set. And finally, we return the result. And the last thing we need is a serialization serial version U ID to appease the serialization gods. Um, so that's it. This actually is the serialization proxy of enum set. And by the way, why is it such a good thing for enum set? I'll tell you why. It turns out that the class 
of the thing can change between the time it's serialized and deserialized. How can that happen? It turns out that under the covers, there are two classes that implement enum set. They're called regular enum set and jumbo enum set. If the underlying enumerated type has 64 or fewer elements, then you use a regular enum set, which is just a wrapper for a long, where one bit represents the presence or absence of every element. If, on the other hand, you have more than 64 elements in the underlying enum type, then you use a jumbo enum set, which takes an entire array of these things. Now, suppose that I have an enumerated type with like, oh, 60 elements in it, and I serialize an enum set of that type. Now, suppose I add 10 more elements. Now it's got 70, and then I deserialize it. Well, I serialized it as a regular enum set, but it deserializes as a jumbo. So that's kind of why I came up with this pattern. But afterwards, I decided it was, you know, well, we, we came to the conclusion that it was much more generally applicable. In, in fact, um, there, there are, you know, many cases in which you should use it. Is it a panacea? Of course not. There are no panaceas, especially for something as complicated as serialization. So what's wrong with it? First of all, it is completely incompatible with extendable classes. It only works, and by extendable, by the way, I mean externally extendable. It only works for a class that is kind of closed within a library. So if you look at a new set, yeah, I have two subclasses of it, but they're mine. You cannot extend an set. If you could, then the serialization proxy approach wouldn't work. Also, it is incompatible with some classes whose object graphs contain circularities. This is actually a fairly complex topic addressed in more detail in the book. Um, but at any rate, you know, enum sets are kind of nice because there are no circularities. What do I mean by that? Just that the elements of an enum set are just the enums. They cannot point back to the enum set. Um, and also, it's a little bit more expensive. On my machine, it adds about 15% to the cost of serialization and deserialization. That's not a magic number, 15, but just, you know, it adds a little to the price. But where it is applicable is by far the easiest way to robustly serialize complex objects. It, it avoids, you know, all of those horrendous problems with serialization that I listed on the first slide. So that's it. That was a pretty long talk, so I'm going to very quickly go over the key ideas in the whole talk. First of all, if you remember nothing else from tonight, remember pecs. Flex your pecs. All together now, producer extends consumer super. There you go. Um, and when a fixed number of type parameters just won't do for a collection-like thing, if you need an arbitrary number of them, use that type-safe heterogeneous container pattern. Prefer two element enums to booleans. Never, ever synchronize in a concurrent collection. That's the other if you only remember one thing from tonight. Don't synchronize on concurrent collections. Instead, use put if absent, but generally read the value before calling put if absent, and always look at the return value from put if absent. And finally, when your plans call for serialization, remember the serialization proxy pattern. So that's it for this talk. Um, if you want more, then you should get this fine book now in its fine second edition. Um, and we have uh, uh, one, one little bit of dessert, one more puzzler. Are you guys up for one puzzler? All right, um, I know this is a long talk, but anyway, so here's our puzzle. Um, it's called When Words Collide. I think there may be a typo in the title. And what this does, this is a very strange puzzle, because we have two classes, print words and words. And here's how the game is played. We compile these two classes together, then we recompile words. So this is a second version of words. And we run the class file that came out of the first compilation with the class file for words that came out of the second compilation. And you know, before you say, but that's totally ridiculous, Josh, why would anyone do that? That turns out to be a kind of a microcosm for what happens all the time with libraries. You compile your client with version one of a library, and then the vendor releases version two, and you should not have to recompile your classes. You should just be able to re run them, you know, with the binary for the new version of the library and everything should just keep running. So in this case, what does our client do? It simply prints out three words, words.first, words.second, and words.third. In the original version of the words class, the words are the null, and that's the actual null pointer, set, the null set. Um, and in the new version, the words are physics, chemistry, and biology. So the question then is, if I run the program, does it print the null set, physics, chemistry, biology, 
Does it throw an exception, or does it do something else entirely? Don't don't yell it out if you know it. Just think about it. Uh, yes, they're, they're compiled with the same JDK. Any JDK you like. I heard someone asking the, the correct question in the front row, which is, does it inline the constants? Very good question. I could tell you, but that would take all the fun out of the puzzle then, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay. I think it's time to vote. Yeah? All right. So how many people say this program will print the null set? Which would mean it, it inlines them. Oh, that looks like 60% of you. How many people say physics, chemistry, biology? It doesn't inline them. 20% of you. How many people say throws an exception? 5% of you. And how many people say none of the above? Five more percent of you. Well, it turns out that those final 5% of you were in fact correct. This program will print, it will always print, the chemistry set. Which is kind of strange. Yeah, I, I see someone up here who got it. But anyway, it's very, very, let's take another look at the program. The, the, uh, the intuition here is constant variables are inlined, but what is a constant variable? I mean, constant variable, isn't that like a little bit of an oxymoron now, constant variable? Well, here's how a constant variable is defined. Roughly, it's a, a final primitive or string variable. So you can't be a constant unless you're a primitive or string whose value is a compile time constant. It turns out you have to read all four, all three of these sections of the JLS to actually get the whole definition. But it turns out that null is not a constant variable. Go figure, right? It turns out that it doesn't have a constant pool entry. So basically it's any compile time constant, primitive or string, but not null. And notice that enums are never constant expressions. Now let's go back to our program. Constant, not a constant, constant, which means the and set are in fact compiled into the program. No is not, so when we're running against this, we print the chemistry set. Mystery solved, right? But what can we do to fix this? I.e., you know, this probably isn't the behavior that was desired. Well, here's a neat trick. If you want to prevent something from being inlined, simply call the identity method on it. So we have a method here called ident on string that simply returns its argument. Now we say public static final string first equals ident of the. We're doing a method invocation. And once you do a method invocation, it's not a constant anymore. And this is a, a way to force the compiler not to inline things that shouldn't be inlined. But it raises the question, you know, what should be inlined and what shouldn't be? And the moral basically is that you should only use constant variables for entities whose values will never change. So e, that's a reasonable constant variable. Pi, sure. Number of planets in the solar system? Well, I think that changed, you know? So basically, if there's any chance the thing is ever going to change, don't use a compile time constant. You can make it a public static final, but initialize it to something that's not a constant expression and do be aware that null is not a constant. That's sort of counterintuitive, but it is true. And I guess that's it for tonight. So thank you very much for coming to the talk. And before we go, <laughs> before we go, so I have a couple books to give out. So on the honor system, um, I guess there were a total of three puzzles, right? Two before and one after. So who got all three right? Raise your hands. All right, two of you and I, oh wait, three of you. All right, so we're gonna have to do some, some coin tossing here. The three of you who got them all right, come on up and we will uh, distribute books. And the rest of you, thanks a lot and I hope to see you again soon.